I think we'll make a start. I've been told I need to start right on time because this, uh, this next session, it's kind of like the premiership quarter. We've brought out the big guns for this next session, so you can all uh, rest easy with the food in your belly. No, no one's going to fall asleep. Um, we've got some really good uh, speakers coming up. Um, first of all, we've got Darren Vaux. His uh, name's synonymous uh, in the industry. He's, I think it's his third presentation for the day. I don't know whether he enjoys a, a bottle of wine or two um, from his collection today or he just enjoys public speaker. He's a very good public speaker, no doubt. You've all enjoyed his session so far. Um, he's coming up to talk about land and seabed lease frameworks for a sustainable marina investment. You're welcome, uh, Darren. Thanks, James. Um, let me start off with something important. I don't want to be here. And I don't think you want to be here either. And the only reason we're here is that we're talking about something that we shouldn't have to talk about. And so why are we here? We're here fundamentally because some government landlords undervalue the contributions that marinas make to local economies, to employment, to tourism, to social well-being, to the social fabric that people that enjoy an outdoor lifestyle enjoy. It's undervalued. But at the same time, they overvalue our industry. The perception is that our clients are wealthy, that they're the elite, and as a consequence, our businesses must be making lots of money, and as a result, we should be paying more. They're the two fundamental reasons. We shouldn't have to talk about this. This should be an industry that government goes out of its way to support, like it does with other infrastructure. Look at other supports, money that gets spent on stadiums, money that gets spent on other social infrastructure to support outcomes for participation rates way below voting, way below. Three to five million people a year in this country go boating, and yet the level of support that it gets is low. And the financial framework that delivers what we need to deliver in relation to this underlying public infrastructure, the land water interface, boat storage and enabling infrastructure, fundamentally, by a lot, not all, but by a lot of government departments, is not supported with a financial framework that is sustainable. So what do we want? Let's start, the first thing you do, let's walk in someone else's shoes. What do governments want from our industry? They want us to provide boat storage, servicing, amenities, access to the waterways. They want us to meet the needs of the boating and general community. But at the same time, they want us to deliver it in a way that minimises the risk to government and provides a fair return to public assets. Do we object to that? Does anybody think that that's an unreasonable thing for a government to expect from our industry. I think that's a reasonable package. But what do we want? What do we need? We need a framework that actually creates something that's attractive. We've got to have a framework, a, a, an investment platform that provides us with sustainable private sector investment. Why would you invest dollars in this particular sector compared to another sector? We have to attract investment, you know, investment frameworks. But to do that, it's not just about the initial investment. We've got to develop the marinas, we've got to operate them, we've got to renew them, we've got to adapt them. These are long-term investments. We've got to have the capability to reinvest to create outcomes. And part of that, and something that's not often talked about, is you know, what are we in business for? We're in business to create value. We want to build our goodwill. We want to create assets that, that from our effort, from our intellectual property and from our investment, from our risk-taking and from good practice, delivers value that we can realise. And these are the things that are often forgotten because these are the important inputs into financial frameworks that actually deliver good investment outcomes and make these compete. So let's just go back and just take a step back and say what are the real factors that affect marina investments? Clearly, normal commercial factors, demand for the services, competition, you know, the physical attributes of where it is. These are all things that we know intimately. They're fundamental development parameters. You build you know, infrastructure where infrastructure is needed, both from a you know, market demand point of view and where it's appropriate. But we are faced with enormous regulatory constraints, you know, planning constraints, environmental constraints, all of those things. Once again, 
technically we can deal with that stuff. We have technologies, we have great products, we have great abilities to do these things. But it's the point when we get to, when you look at the underlying elements of the investment framework, when we get to the availability and appropriate terms of government concessions and how that impacts on the available capital, debt frameworks and ultimately the, invested, you know, the ultimate projected investment return. And I think one of the things is why is this a discussion that we're having now? It's a discussion we've actually been having for a long time, but it has progressively got more difficult. It's got more difficult because historically there's always been a renegotiation with the incumbent lessee. There's been this underlying premise that renegotiate with incumbent lessee, extensions to terms during the term and those sorts of things, and that's just got harder over time. But we're not alone. This phenomenon exists all over the world. And I can tell you from the research that I've done and the people that I've spoken to, every single time where tenure is brought into question or rents are put to unsustainable levels, it happens for a short time and then the government realises the decimation that it causes to the industry and quickly reverses it. The big problem we've got, it's the inconsistency in policy and strategy that actually creates uncertainty in the marketplace, coupled with a more sophisticated finance market, so that now we find ourselves in a position where marinas are more difficult to fund, because they're seen as uncertain investments because of the changes in policy frameworks. So what are the key things that we need to talk about? We need to talk about rent. We need to talk about seabed and land rents and how they can be framed in a way that makes it sustainable for investment. We need to talk about what is an appropriate term for a marina lease and to what, you know, what ability do we have during the term and at the end of the term to extend that lease. We need to talk about options because options can actually appear to be you know, a natural extension of the lease but the terms of those options are really important. And we need to talk about the administrative burden that is built within leases that imposes upon us a whole range of different administrative costs that in reality are completely unnecessary. So let's have a quick look at what the factors are that influence marina rents. Na naturally, it's going to be the range of uses within the marina itself. The size of the vessels to be stored, what is the access to the facility, you know, what's the water depth and all those sorts of things. That is determining you know, how, what sort of area of seabed you need is going to be influenced by all of these factors. What's interesting about that is, of course, because of that, for any given boat length capacity within a marina, there can be a massive variation as to the seabed area. So at the end of the day, area is in fact a very poor determiner of rent. But a lot of times that rent is determined by doing comparable land values, using those sorts of elements which don't apply as a, as a relevant factor to marinas. At the end of the day, you've got to look at what the capacity is, what the market positioning is, and then work out what the capacity for storage that that particular site can accommodate. So this comes down to the premise of saying, why do we use turnover rents or why is a sustainable occupancy cost model the most appropriate way to be able to determine how we move forward with marinas and their rental capacity? And basically it's to try and get a fair reflection of the earning capacity of the site and therefore determine how that relates to the underlying sustainable occupancy cost. In other words, from first principles, look at the business premise of the, of the marina, look at its capacity, look at its cost of delivery, and then reverse, do a reverse calculation to determine, based on acceptable investment returns, what is the sustainable rent that can be paid to provide a reasonable return from the investment that's being made. And so, turnover is often used as a mechanism of actually being able to achieve that. It doesn't actually have to be manifest within a lease to say, well, that's it, every year you're going to pay turnover. It can be used to determine a rental amount that then gets adjusted. But from a market rent point of view, it actually forms the only sensible way of doing it because comparable sites, firstly, no mar two marinas are the same. Secondly, industrial sites aren't relevant as comparables. And so as a consequence, we need to have something that really focuses back on this sustainable co you know, occupancy cost. So here's an example of a turnover rent framework that exists within the RMS policy within New South Wales. Now this is tied into what's called the destinations plan, but essentially it looked at being able to provide a sliding scale against the turnover of berthing revenue within a marina. 
And it gives you a sense as to the types of ranges of, of percentages that are applied in that particular. So this applies to Sydney Harbour. But what's interesting is if you then take that and you look at the other components of a marina business, there's then other parameters to say, well, how do you then factor in land-related items and things like that? Once again, I'm saying this is a policy that comes from uh, New South Wales. And it's just an example of where there's been an attempt to look at the underlying business model of a marina and translate it into a framework for um, underlying rent performance and sustainable occupancy cost. So the issue that also comes into play is how do you deal with sites that are a mixture of leasehold and freehold? Now, there are a number of sites where there's seabed leases, but there's freehold land. And so a question needs to be asked is how do you attribute, for instance, you know, do you apply a percentage to the birthing revenue, but what about the birthing revenue can't be considered in isolation because the parking and the infrastructure, the amenities that are on the land, obviously are a contributing factor to the ability to generate that revenue. And so, you know, should there be a split? Should 40% of the income that's received on birthing be attributed to the land and therefore not applied? for the purposes of turnover rent. I think that's something that should be open for discussion, but a lot of these times these conversations um, haven't happened and you're getting a situation where what's occurring on the water is being 100% attributed to the water side. The other thing that comes to, to play, and it depends on where you are in different states and things like that, but in New South Wales, for instance, that if you have a leasehold marina, you still pay land tax at the same rate as if you owned the freehold land. And that has to be factored in as part of the overall burden that exists in the rental cost and the underlying cost associated with the uh, sustainable occupancy cost for the marina. So, beware of ratchet rents. Ratchet rents are a classic uh, rental parameter that's built within typical commercial leases where you pay the greater of either last year's rent or turnover for this year's rent. Now that's all fine when you're in an inflationary environment um, and you've got growth in revenue and things like that, but our circumstance where we've got very long-term leases, there's high probabilities that there's going to be downturns. But the worst case scenario is, of course, that you've had a very good period and a very strong growth and your turnover's gone up very high, then all of a sudden there's a, it comes off a cliff, but if you've got a ratchet rent, you'll pay the equivalent of what you paid last year, your rent won't come off. And I think that that's something that we be, need also to be very careful of, can be buried within the lease terms. Because you can see in this particular graph that you know, the green line represents the consequences of what would happen if you're ratcheted out. And in fact, the, at the point in time when you can least afford to pay the rents is where your rent remains at a much higher percentage than it otherwise would be. The next one, and this becomes the one that's really interesting. Who owns the goodwill? We own the goodwill. But here's the thing that's really interesting. If basically lease terms are absolutely lease term certain and there is no chance of renewal whatsoever, then every single marina operator in their right mind would amortise all of their capital and all of their goodwill to zero at the end of the lease. So if you've got a 40 year lease, what's a marina look like that's had half its capital and half its goodwill amortised over the first 20 years. Pretty ordinary. What's it look like after 30 years? Very ordinary. What's it look like towards the end? Appalling. Is that the industry we want? Do you think that's the industry that the government wants? That it's going to be worse the day after we've done our investment and we're going to bring it all the way down to nothing at the end? Is that what we really want? Because that's what those policies deliver. And that's what we have to communicate. And I don't think we communicate it well enough because that is absolutely the reality of what should happen in all of those circumstances. But what's happened in the past is we've had the ability to reinvest, get an extension, reinvest, get an extension. It's the green line. Because what do we want to do as business people? We want to grow our businesses, we want to perform, we want to adapt to our consumers' needs, we want to compete, we want to be able to grow our revenue, and we want to have goodwill that ultimately we can sell to someone else. That's what business is. But at the moment there's this disconnection, this tension between proper investment frameworks 
and some of the policy platforms that are being put forward. This is a key issue for us as an industry if we intend to take our industry forward. We need to get governments to accept that we can have a framework, have a lease framework built into the leases themselves that formularise or provide a mechanism for us to reinvest during the course of the lease and extend our lease. So let's deal with it bluntly. Does this effectu effectively perpetuate the lease? Yes, it does. Now, you look at that from a policy point of view. That's quite difficult. The government says, well, I can't, we can't give you a perpetual lease. And the, the, the answer to that is, well, what about if someone else wants to invest in this or they want to do something like that? Every single marina, every single commercial marina, if you're in business, your marina's for sale. It's a matter of price. Of course it's a matter of price. So every single marina is available for someone else to take hold of at a certain price. But the reality is, unless we adopt these sorts of principles, unless we look at this, because we need to take a, a step back. The step back is, why are they leases? Is the intention to say they're leases because the government thinks, well, at some point in time, we don't think there'll be any marinas? Or it's seabed, so we don't really have a head around freeholding the seabed. It's not a principle we know, so therefore we won't allow it to be freehold. We have to look and say, what is the, why, why are they actually leasehold? And the question really comes to point, I'm not sure. Why can't the seabed be freehold? It certainly is if you take freehold land and dig your own seabed out, which happens in Queensland. It doesn't happen in New South Wales. And so those sorts of principles, I think, are things that we really need to get to the point. The question is, do we need this? Or should marinas really, should the government step back and say, look, in reality, these are important infrastructure, they're important social infrastructure, they're better than stadiums, they engage with more people, we should just make them freehold, and then we'll provide a framework for that, or we're going to provide a framework that enables people to invest and grow, reconfigure, put it all through, and actually come with a, an appropriate outcome. Because from the government's point of view, if we're going to have to amortise it down to zero, and they're running off turnover rents, then the green line's their future income profile. That fails the test of fair return for public assets. Certainly fails the test for fair return for delivering proper public infrastructure, because at the end of the day, the government makes a decision to get private enterprise to come forward to invest to deliver these sorts of outcomes to deliver what is effectively publicly accessible infrastructure at the land water interface. And so that's the sort of key that we've got to get to. There needs to be this understanding and like I said, this isn't just an Australian phenomenon. This is an international phenomenon. There's discussions about this. There's policy being developed at an international level to try and communicate these types of issues so that we can actually address this because we've talked about it for too long. And we aren't getting anywhere because the message isn't getting through. And the reality is that it's getting harder. And if it keeps getting harder, the industry will continue to suffer. So we need to, we need to draw a line on it and say, right, enough's enough. Let's actually just get this fixed so that we can get a framework that enables us to move forward. So let's look at marinas themselves as an investment performance. This is an extract from a chart that was done by Knight Frank. And it compares marinas at a yield curve basis with industrial. It's not bad. They track, interestingly enough, the, the curves track relatively um, common with them. And you can see over those sort of periods of time, over that 10-year zone, how they went up over through the GFC periods, and they come back down and they're, they're rolling, but they're always sitting up a little bit higher. So the question has to come to play, and this is always an interesting one. Marina revenues are actually quite resilient. You know, the, the core marina, the boat storage side of it, are reasonably resilient because boats need to be stored somewhere. And so they're actually more resilient than retail, for instance because retail business is in very tough economic times. There is a lot of vacancies that come through and things like that. So if you look at the fickle nature of cash flow on certain comparable property style assets, marinas actually in the boat storage side of it has shown great resilience. So the question has to be, why are the cap rates higher? The cap rates are higher because of the uncertainty driven by the leasehold nature, the policy change framework, and a whole bunch of other things. So once again, it makes it difficult to attract capital and attract funding when there's that uncertainty. So it's just further evidence of the process that this actually needs to be addressed. So let's go through and have a look and say, what are the core lease conditions that need to be, be allocated and dealt with? Excuse me for a sec. Lease conditions themselves have got more complex over time. 
And I think that's interesting. It's a part of this control process of saying, well, we want you to be able to, you know, you need to report to us on this, you need to do all of these sorts of things. Let's take a step back. This is a land lease. This is mud. We're coming in, we're putting the piles in, we're putting the pontoons, we're doing all this. We're taking, actually taking all the risk. The, the, the leases go a long way to say it is all your risk. And so the process then to come back and say it's all your risk, but by the way, you better tell us about everything that's going on all the time and seek our consent for all of these things. It's an administrative burden that's completely unnecessary. It's unnecessary for us, but it's unnecessary for government landlords as well because it just creates administrative burden for them because then they're forced to deal with their side of the leasehold side of it. So I think we need to sort of step back from it and say there needs to be a framework that says, look, what's reasonable? How do we actually manage that? Recognise that they need to have communication, there needs to be mechanisms and risk allocation, but how do we deal with it in a way that makes it work for everyone? And I think one of the key things here that everyone needs to be aware of is when you go into a lease and you go, right, my lease is 25 years and I've got a 15-year option, so it adds up to 40 years, that's great. Have a very, very, very close look at your option terms. Because option terms typically in most leases, commercial leases, shorts, five plus fives, always say that the right to exercise the option is predicated on the basis that you've been a compliant tenant, that you've met all of the obligations under the lease. Tell me how reasonable it is to actually meet every single obligation under your lease over a 25-year period, never missed a beat, never missed a payment or otherwise. And that's the thing that's a real issue because when you get to a point, leverage can then be applied to say, well, back in 1985, you missed your lease payment by a week. You know, and all of a sudden you go, well, technically, you haven't complied with all your obligations under the lease. And so, once again, you're saying that there's mechanisms that are incorporated within marina leases that are not relevant to the nature of the investment. Now, this isn't my sort of view on this, and I know I hold a reasonably strong view, but it's not predicated on the basis that I think that there's any th malicious intent. I don't think there's malicious intent. I think the government wants the outcomes that I said at the beginning. But the difficulty is we've got... There's, it's a very unique space. We're operating within a unique environment, and we need to create a framework. We, as an industry, need to come together to create a framework where we can properly communicate it so that we can actually deliver this as a proper outcome. So let's just take a step back. Why? Why are we here? Where we started? I don't want to be here. You shouldn't have to be here. We're here because they were always, in the background, renewed. This wasn't an issue. 20 years ago, this wasn't an issue. This was what happened. You just went through and you, you had your frame. But then, over time, this politicisation. I don't know if, how many of you heard my theory about super yachts. The best way to transfer wealth from a billionaire to, a, to the working class is to actually get them to buy a super yacht. Um, because that's what happens. Our industry takes wealthy people, we sell them a boat, we build the boat, we maintain the boat, and all the people that work at our marinas earn money. They pay tax. It's a distribution of wealth. So, and this is the thing, in a political sense, it's we don't want to help them, they're the rich. But actually, our industry actually distributes that wealth back out through society, economic multipliers, all of those sorts of things. Government agencies are under increasing pressure to self-fund, to achieve market reference returns. But market reference returns to what? And these are the things. Sometimes some of the policies say, well, you've got to achieve a 7% return. But 7% on what, how, why? You know, against land, but they're not valuing the outcomes that we're delivering to them. And I guess one of the challenges, and this, I'm not picking on clubs, but let's be realistic. Commercial marinas, we are seen as privatisation of the waterfront. Clubs, they're seen as community outcomes. You can come to my marina, your marina, everyone else's marina, by just either coming down having a coffee, anybody can come to our marina, they can go out on the marina, they can do what they like. It's publicly accessible infrastructure. If you're a club, sorry, not a member, can't come in. So there's this differentiation. But as if you're a club, we'll renew your lease. You're the community. We'll give you favourable terms. You're the community. Like I said, I'm not picking on clubs. Clubs are a very important part of our industry. But this, dis this disconnection between commercial marinas, seen as the, this private enterprise thing that's earning lots of money off public assets compared to clubs, and then compared to government-owned um, environments that compete in the same space, 
is creating a playing field that is anything but level. You can see my little elephant in the corner there. Corruption. Corruption. Anti-corruption policies are paralysing administration. It's a bigger elephant. The cost of corruption. New South Wales, we've had a few challenges with political corruption in the past, but they've manifested themselves into policy outcomes that stifle investment. A lot of these corruption responses, which had nothing to do with marinas, absolutely nothing to do with marinas, created policy outcomes that said, everything's got to go to public tender. Everything's got to be transparent. Everything's got to be open. There can be no direct negotiation. There's probity. There's all of these types of things. But how does it manifest itself? It certainly shouldn't justify the exclusion of direct negotiation in long-term leases. But sometimes the policies do that. It shouldn't you know, justify the move away from lease renewal with incumbent lessees, but that's what some of the consequences have been. It certainly doesn't justify the appropriation of our goodwill, but that's what these exercises are doing. If they're saying, there is no chance, we're not going to negotiate with you during the term of your lease, your lease certain is that's it, then essentially what they're saying is you either amortise it down to zero or we'll get to the end and then we'll um, say, see you later, and then we'll sell it to someone else. And you think, that's, it. that's outrageous. It's already happened. We had a circumstance in New South Wales where got to the, you know, one operator got to the end of the lease and all of a sudden there was a charge for improvement rent. Improvement rent was rent paid on infrastructure that they'd paid for, but was valued at the end of the lease as improvements existing on the land. So we need to be very cognizant of the fact that these are serious issues that can prejudice the real value of our marina investments. And I guess one of the greatest challenges that we have is that we are dealing with monopolistic landlords. So we are individuals. A lot of our commercial entities require us to have confidentiality agreements in our dealing with government. But the government is a monopoly operating in a commercial space. They are not bound by the same law that corporations are bound by in dealing in trade practices. They are, however, um, bound by procurement law that they have, their own policies and all of those sorts of things. And I think, when you delve into some of those policies, that you need to explore um, the principles that lie behind their own policies. Because those policies, they talk about transparency. They talk about fairness. They talk about a whole range of elements which I think sometimes the exercise within those is questionable. And so we need, as an industry, we need to be more open. We need to share information. We need to share what rent we're being paid. We need to share the issues that we're facing. We need to create a database so that we can, as an industry, stand united in being able to produce a framework that gives us the ability to be able to create you know, a strength of position so that when we're dealing with government in a state-by-state -state basis, in a national basis, and even at an international basis, we have the intelligence that we need to be able to create convincing arguments that support what we're trying to achieve. So, what do I think a marina lease framework is? Well, at the end of the day, I think that the sustainable occupancy level that exists within marinas, based on all the research I've seen and all of the international work that I've seen, is that the rents on berthing is somewhere between 4 and 6% of the gross turnover. That the minimum um, framework for doing market reviews has to be based on first principles, on a sustainable cost occupancy basis. Any landlord that says that only comparable land values will be used as a basis to determine marina rents is being disingenuous in actually delivering sustainable occupancy costs. Because in any valuation framework, you have to look at all of the parameters. But in a specialised asset basis, you can only do it by going back to look at a sustainable framework to do it properly. Lease terms should be at least 40 years because you've got to look at that to say that you've got to have a framework 
You look at all the good quality facilities that we've got out there, all of those good quality facilities, 50 year design lives, all of those sorts of things, you've got to have a 40 year, 40 year term. I can tell you if your lease term is less than 25 years to begin with, it can't be treated as, an in, as a property asset, it has to be valued from a bank's point of view on a going concern asset, which means that the whole financial framework doesn't work. So it has to be a minimum of 40 years, but more importantly, there's got to be some mechanism within it, whether it's related, based on reinvestment, whether it's based on industry standards like gold anchor and those things that you've got to achieve a certain performance level, and that's the platform on which you can then continue um, to move forward. And then the options within those, first they've got to be on the same commercial terms, it's not a, it's not a platform for renegotiation, but secondly, they've got to have an appropriate balance of lease performance and remedy. These are underlying commercial parameters, so to, to exercise your option, it needs to be sensible and reasonable. Sure, you've got to be a good tenant, sure you've got to be something, you know, you've got to have a good relationship and be moving forward, but you've got, there's got to be some fair mechanisms in there to be able to deal with it. So, to give you the background to it, some of the work that's been happening at an international level with Icomia is that we've worked up policies associated with sustainable rents, we've worked out policies associated with marina tenure, but I think the next step for us is to then look at it and say, what can we do to actually get model conditions in relation to lease terms? Some fundamental terms in terms of renewal, fundamental terms in terms of operational side of it, and those sorts of elements, to be able to take it so that we have, as an industry, a framework that we can sort of work our way forward. So that will give us a complete picture. But at the same time, I think we need to be more open in the way that we share commercial information with each other. And I think that we need to look at it and say, how do we, as an industry, share the information that we have to be able to, A, benchmark ourselves so we know where we are, B, when we're going to rent renews, know what the real market positions are so that we're able to compete properly and understand and all those sorts of things, so that we're able to defeat circumstances because the biggest risk we have is when you have monop monopolistic landlords is that they can ratchet the, the rents up by manipulating each review. So the market rent moves to here, moves to here, moves to here, moves to here, moves to here. And so all that's happening and you think, well, why are they doing that? Because they think that the process is that they have a responsibility to grow revenue from the underlying state assets. But at the end of the day, if they really wanted an investment and achieve the real outcomes, then they've got to provide a sustainable investment framework underneath. So that's the sort of um, context. And I guess you look at it and we just, <laughs> what are we asking for? Rents that we can afford. What are we asking for? Lease terms that have some certainty to them so that we can grow our businesses, grow our goodwill, create value, and then create a framework to go forward. Is it unreasonable? Unreasonable? I don't think so. Is it logical? I think it is. Um, why can't we do it? Why isn't it happening? Is it a communication issue? Have we failed to communicate you know, the, the benefits that come from it? I think we've worked pretty hard at that. Somehow we've got to find a way of breaking this nexus um, so that in two years' time we don't have to have this conversation again. So, uh, you know, I sort of look at it and I go, when you look at different types of marinas, fully leasehold, leasehold land, you know, ones that are on pure freehold land, think about if you're a fully leasehold marina, the different approach that you would take to the way you'd approach your investment if it was just all freehold. And you think that's the investment mindset that we have to create with a leasehold environment. We have to create a freehold equivalent mindset in, within the investors in this. I'm being wound up by the president in the front there. So hopefully that gives you a framework. I know that my friend Trent is waiting for me to be overcapacitated, but I think I've got to that particular point. Um, thank you for listening. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I'll let him go a little bit longer because he shot a few, uh, put a few shots over the bow there with some of his discussion. I hope there's some regulators or other marina owners that want to have some input or some questions. So if anyone has any questions, put their hand up.
Well, this is where I think, um, and you raise a brilliant point, because I think it's massively inappropriate that a monopolistic landlord can actually incorporate a non-disclosure clause within a negotiation. I think that, and this is where I believe that we need, as an industry, to have a very hard look at broader, higher level government policy. Because when you look at, for instance, um, procurement policies and government policies that exist on ethics and various other things that they are published, if you have a look at them, one of the key tenets that comes out of that is fairness. So if you have an imbalance of power between two entities, then you have to balance power to create fairness. Non-disclosure arrangements in a monopolistic circumstance is not fair. So as an industry, I think we've got to come out with very strong policy to say that that isn't fair. We have to call it out. Because otherwise, we need to be able to share. We need to, you need to be able to say, well, look, these guys are thinking that the market rents this. What is that? What's, what, what's our intelligence say? You know, we need to be able to say. We, don't, we can protect our own commerciality by having it done through the association or done through a third party to say, well, here is, you know, geographically located, here's the range, here's where it all sits, and these are what the rent ranges are within that for these different types of marinas. Then we've got some power. Because those non-disclosures, I think, are very, very dangerous. Any other questions for Darren? I'm going to have to limit you to one minute answers at the moment, Darren. One minute, good luck. <laughs> yeah. That was a really good presentation, Darren. Thank you. Um, I worked with Crown Lands. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you thought about um, collectively from the MI putting towards a lease agreement, you know, with a few different sort of variations. One is freehold and freehold leasehold and leasehold licence. Yeah, and you put like a standard one forward and then that becomes, becomes a base template for, you know, the terms of the negotiation. Yeah, and I, th and I think that's, that's a really good question because I think that's our next step. I think part of this issue is communication. We've, we've talked about this, sustainable occupancy cost and rents and tenures and things like that. There's been lots of discussions back and forward about rental policies and the way they've changed over time. But I, honest, I think that our next step is to say, this is, for instance, for want of a better term, this is the Marina Industries Association template lease for marinas in these three circumstances. And I think that gives, gives us an ability to be able to really deal with the detail and justify why we believe those parameters are right. Yeah, I think that's the next step. Yep, great. Love to work with you on it. Okay, I've got time one more. There is. Good, we can. Oh, that's one, John. Darren, John Hogan, Superior Jetties. Uh, in the US, I noticed the uh, US Army Corps of Engineers have a lot of marinas that they develop on uh, the dams, particularly. And they do a deal based upon a percentage of revenue. Mm -hmm. So they actually partner with the marina. And uh, it seems to have worked well for a long time. Yep. With very successful businesses. But in effect, the government is a partner with the owner. Have you seen anything like that here? Uh, not to that extent. The, the Army Corps of Engineers is the largest marina landlord in the world. Um, they have a turnover rent model that is, uh, ranges between 25 and 4%. Um, and again, um, they're about creating a framework for it to be dealt with on the long term. So they're not tied down on the tenure model as well. And I think that they are, it's a, it's a great thing where it's, for them, it's not an issue in that sense because they're trying to activate it and provide that infrastructure. And I think the key for us is that, like I said, we need to get to a position where, for all intents and purposes, our land leases are as good in our own mind and in, and in banking minds and otherwise are as good as freehold. Right? That's where we need to get to. Um, because otherwise, we're just constantly fighting that constraint. So that, the model that's over there, there's plenty of models around the world that we can draw on, um, but as my friend over here said, I think the best step for us is to actually build this model of the template leases to say these are the terms that we believe are actually required to sustain investment in this sector.